And uh, we'll, you know, I'll talk for a bit, and then we'll leave time so that we can talk together and have a discussion or have Q&A, whatever you like. So thanks for being here at this festival weekend, and thanks for being here specifically, because there's a lot of other exciting things to do. So today's talk is called Eating the Earth, Transforming Destruction into Sustainability. So first I'm going to adapt a parable from John Robbins. There was once two men in a village, uh, and there was a vegetarian wise man who had a peaceful, happy life. And there was a carnivorous wise guy who sort of wanted to make everyone as miserable as he was. So this uh, wise guy hatched a scheme. He caught a bird, and he held it in his hands, and he thought he would go to that vegetarian wise man, ask him if the bird was alive or dead. And if the vegetarian said that the bird was dead, then he would let the bird go and show, oh, it was alive, you were wrong. And if the vegetarian said the bird was alive, then he would pinch the bird's neck and kill it and show him a dead bird. So that was his plan. And he finally took this bird to the vegetarian wise man and said, is this bird in my hand alive or dead? And the vegetarian wise man said, the answer is in your hands. So we know that eating meat is dangerous for human health. It's the leading cause of the leading diseases of our world. The number one cause of death in this world is heart disease, accounting for approximately 40% of uh, fatalities. And whenever they do autopsies on people and they find that it was heart disease, it's pretty gross. They pull out long, thick strands of cholesterol. Cholesterol only comes from animals and animal products, including us. We make our own cholesterol, which is why we don't need to ingest any cholesterol. We get what we need. It's when we take in cholesterol from eating animals and animal products that we have an excess. And they, pull, they literally pull this out of people, and you can see these chunks of fatty cholesterol. Here's something that they never pull out of people when they do autopsies. No one gets heart disease from broccoli. No one is getting cancer from broccoli, the number two cause of death. No one is getting stroke from broccoli and tofu. That's the number three cause of death. Um, excess cholesterol, excess saturated fat, animal protein has also been associated with osteoporosis, with... Um, all sorts of things, gout, kidney disease, uh, even a study showing that uh, there may be a cholesterol Alzheimer's connection. There's so many. That's just health. Uh, we're not going to go spend too much time on health except to realize for our purposes here that our health is our primary environment. So when we think about the environment, it's not just out there. Our primary environment is our environment because what happens outside affects us on the inside. And of course, it's a two-way street. Uh, a former Surgeon General said that about two-thirds of diseases in the US are diet-related. And vegetarian and vegan nutrition has been proven to be safe, even superior in terms of health, not deficient. So many people erroneously think that there's uh, deficient nutrition, make sure you're getting enough. But look at the people who are saying, make sure you're getting enough. Well, so many people in this country are overweight and obese, suffering from all sorts of diseases, not de diseases of deficiency, but diseases of overconsumption. Right? We don't have diseases of deficiency very common. People worry about our protein intake, right? But are you getting enough protein? Right? I'm just curious because maybe some of us know, do you know the name of the disease of protein deficiency? Yeah, kwashiorkor. Okay, so here we're relatively educated. Some people sort of know it. 
but talk to the people who say, you can't live without protein, you have to eat meat. And they will, and ask them if they know the name of this disease, ask them if they've ever met anyone who's been diagnosed with protein deficiency. They haven't. The people with protein deficiency are the people who are uh, having calorie deficiency, people who are starving to death, people who are malnourished. And we do find this, sadly, we find this amongst the poor in poor countries. We don't very much find that in this country, except for the absolute most desperate people. We should also just briefly talk about public health, um, because the meat industry is not just bad for our personal health, but bad for our public health. I'm talking about issues like E. coli, SARS, Salmonella, and we've heard about these outbreaks. When we hear about E. coli, people say, oh yes, it was on spinach or scallions or salmonellas and peanut butter. But where does E. coli come from, I ask them, if you're so concerned about the disease? Because it doesn't come from peanuts. It doesn't come from spinach. It comes from the intestinal guts of animals. And so these diseases are diseases of the livestock industry, of raising animals for meat. And indeed, if we did away with raising animals for meat, we would not have issues of E. coli. We also wouldn't have SARS. We wouldn't have bird flu. We wouldn't have swine flu. All of these diseases emanated from the raising of livestock for food. Um, the prestigious medical journal Lancet said all new infectious diseases of human beings to emerge in the past 20 years have had an animal source. And this is a major public health concern because some of these things can transmute into pandemics. If bird flu becomes more contagious human to human, that's going to create huge problems. And it's only because of this bloodlust that people have for consuming animals. We can also talk about Ebola and AIDS, which are sometimes called the revenge of the rainforest. Ebola and AIDS, we don't know exactly how long they've been around, but we do know once they started uh, building roads into the rainforest, it was easier to um, access these diseases that might have been around and might have been killing small numbers of primates and human beings for quite a while. But building in roads means that people are able to go in more easily for bush meat and people are e more easily coming out with diseases. What actually they think probably happened is people going in for bush meat means killing um, more exotic animals for meat. There was probably someone going into deep into the forest and finding a chimpanzee in a tree, shooting it down, and it falls. And then what happens? They take this bloody carcass and swing it over their back. And there's a simian form of AIDS, of HIV, over their back. And they and the animal perhaps sweating, bleeding. And if the animal is infected with simian HIV, then the blood could have dripped down. And if they're walking barefoot, which probably happened, and they got cut on their foot and the blood mixed, it is probably how the um, AIDS virus got into humans, or so a lot of our scientists suspect. So there's a lot of public health connections. And here's one more. There's, uh, here's, another, here's another quiz. There's a disease called MRSA, M-R-S-A. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, so a few people have, a little bit. Um, in a way, it's, here's, here's, the, here's the illustration. The fact that not everyone is familiar with this shows that we have a deep problem. This is not to diminish AIDS, but MRSA kills more people than AIDS in the United States and around the world. So MRSA, M-R-S-A, is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus is a type of uh, bacteria, and we all have that. Staphylococcus aureus is a certain type of the staph bacteria. And the MA is, uh, or the MR is methicillin, like psyllin is a type of penicillin, an antibiotic, and R is resistant. So it's a superbug, if you will, that's resistant to antibiotics. And so when people get this MRSA, and they're more likely to get it in crowded conditions. So we see it sometimes in schools and locker rooms. We see it in jails and barracks. We see it in hospitals, unfortunately. We also see it on factory farms. 
because they crowd so many animals together. Now we know that for the industry, for the owners, animals are just units of production. They're things. They're commodities to be bought and sold for profit. So they cram maximum animals together so they could maximize their profit. In doing so, and this happens with all crowds, people are more likely to get sick, animals are more likely to get sick, because we see it amongst the animals and we see it against, uh, amongst the, uh, the workers, the farm workers, slaughterhouse workers. Um, and so what they've been doing is feeding antibiotics to animals, even prophylactically. So if they're sick, give them antibiotics. Even if they're not sick, give them antibiotics, so they'll be a little less likely to get sick. And that's true. Except that we know how the world works, and um, the germs, well, they develop resistance so that they can fight it. They become stronger after all this antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are so important, but we don't develop them very quickly in this society, in any society. It takes a long time and a lot of research and a lot of money. We don't have that many. And these are life-saving things, antibiotics. And yet, three-quarters of all the antibiotics consumed in this country is given to farm animals, not to humans. And so if you have a, a cold, the doctor wants to know, well, Let's find out what it is, because if it's, antibiotics aren't right for you, you shouldn't take them. And that's a good thing. But yet, as our doctors are being careful about whether humans are getting antibiotics, it's regularly in the feed of animals. So that literally billions of animals are being fed antibiotics. And then the workers come into contact, and then when people consume milk or dairy or eggs, they are consuming some of the antibiotics, as well as the hormones and the growth stuff and whatever other chemicals they might put in the feed just for productive reasons because they want animals to stay alive and they want them to grow as fast as possible even to be as healthy as possible until they kill them all their babies basically right chickens not even chickens chicks really chickens are killed for food when they're about six weeks old Pigs, maybe six months. Cows, maybe a year or two. It depends. When people eat animals, they're eating babies. Right? And they're eating babies that typically have been pumped up with hormones and chemicals and antibiotics. So um, we also have the fate of the earth in our hands and in our mouths. Uh, humans have become a geological force. But that is the only thing logical about it, because there's nothing logical about the way we're treating the Earth. We're changing the contours of our coastlines and our rivers. We're melting our glaciers and our polar caps. We're poisoning our air and our water. We're burning or clear-cutting our forests with horrific consequences, horrific consequences for those natural wonders in our world, horrific consequences for the animals that live there, for the plants that inhabit those areas, and horrific consequences for us as human beings and for our descendants, some of whom are born, some of those who are yet to be born. We're, as you know, changing our climate and exacerbating global warming dramatically. We're exterminating species at a frighteningly fast pace, forgetting or denying that we ourselves are animals and part of this web of life. We think we can survive by killing off other animals, by exterminating plant species. We think we can. We can for a while. We actually can't as a species. It is not possible. And so in destroying the, anim uh, the environment, we're committing ecocide. That is a killing of the environment, a form of geocide, a killing of our earth. And that leads to forms of genocide because we are wiping out entire species of animals and plants. We're uh, dislocating others. We're forcing the movement of entire ethnicities and nationalities of people who have to move from coastal areas, who have to move from low-lying islands in the South Pacific or an island in India that was being washed over, Lohachara, where the 10,000 residents had to move. But think about being on an island in the South Pacific where it's your entire nationality and ethnicity, all the people who speak your language, practice your religion, your customs, 
where your cemeteries are, where your fields are, where your houses are, where you've played as a kid, and you have to evacuate that island. What happens to the community? They have to disperse. So this is happening to human communities. It's happening to animal communities. It's happening to plant communities. And so when we commit these genocides, and sometimes in some cases, as we're doing all the time, literally every day, killing off species that we haven't even discovered. We're killing off species that we do know about, but we're killing off species that we've never seen, never studied, never understood, never basked in their beauty, knowing that not only is it beautiful in its own right and that the species, say, in the forest have the right to live as they should just on their own right, but it's also worth noting that about a quarter of our medicines originally derived from the rainforest that we have a lot of foods that derive from the rainforest, the indigenous communities that have lived in the rainforest for who knows how many thousands of years and being wiped out rather quickly sometimes. And so when we commit this ecocide, this geocide, and these various forms of genocide, we're also committing a slow form of suicide. We are indeed killing ourselves in body and in spirit. We're acting, acting with disregard, as the lawyers amongst us might say, uh, and we're a danger to both ourselves and others. Clearly, we need to change directions. When we talk about the Amazon rainforest, big and beautiful, the most biodiverse place on the planet, um, we realize that, um, uh, well, how to put this, I mean, 20% of the, I mean, the Amazon is huge. And so it's hard to wrap our minds around this because, okay, so we've destroyed about 20%, about one-fifth of the Amazon rainforest. But if you go there, it's huge. If you look at it from satellite photos, it's huge, and it's still huge. And so it's, I think it's hard for the human brain to fully acknowledge this, that we're destroying the rainforest. It's a finite resource, and just because it's so big doesn't mean that it's infinite. Just because there's so much fresh water, and the Amazon rainforest contains about one-fifth of the world's fresh water, doesn't mean that water is infinite. We breathe in and out. We take in the oxygen. It's so wonderful, right? We breathe in the air and want to hold on to the oxygen. And then we breathe out the air. We're disproportionately breathing out carbon dioxide. It turns out trees and other plant matter do just the opposite. They take in and absorb the carbon dioxide that helps fight global warming. And they exhale oxygen. It's a miracle of coevolutionary development that we breathe each other into continued existence. But we're killing the rainforest. So 20% of the Amazon is gone. 40% or more of the rainforest in Central America. And so of that 20% of the Amazon, about 80% of the land that's been cleared and is no longer a rainforest, 80% is now for cattle grazing. Cheap meat. That's the number one reason by far. But there's another reason why they clear the Amazon, and it's related to the first. They're planting genetically engineered soybeans and foods like that so they could feed it to Brazil's 200 million cows and feed it to the chickens and the pigs to fatten them up faster. It's not natural food for these animals, but they can eat it. So they don't digest it properly, and that creates some problems, creates some suffering for those animals. But no worries, right? Because they'll grow faster, they'll grow fatter, they'll suffer, but no one seems to care about their suffering, not in the business industry. They could be slaughtered and sent up mostly to North America, some other places, mostly to North America, for cheap meat which is why the dollar burger at McDonald's can be a dollar burger now and a dollar burger 10 years ago and 20 years ago, and if we don't change the same dollar burger in 10 years from now. But we are making mincemeat of the rainforest, creating um, cholesterol bad for people's health and creating carbon dioxide bad for global warming simultaneously. And not only do we do that, but if trees are absorbing carbon dioxide, the cutting of trees releases it, and then there's fewer trees to absorb the carbon dioxide. Finally, it's also true that um, you know, green is a lighter color than things like brown, so it actually reflect, reflects more light. 
and now what they do to it makes it that it absorbs more light, therefore more heat. So it creates this, um, this vicious cycle of increasing the pattern of global warming. John Muir was a great American environmentalist, and he started the Sierra Club in San Francisco in 1896, so we're proud to be here. Um, he said that when you tug on anything in the universe, you find it hitched to everything else. That's a good definition of ecology. You find it hitched to everything else. So we're talking about the Amazon, we're talking about water, we're talking about, uh, we can talk about topsoil, we're talking about oxygen, we're talking about heart disease, all of these things are related. We're talking about species extinction and the rights and beauty of nature. All of these things are deeply related. Indeed, the forests of our world are our lungs, the rivers are our circulating system, and the topsoil is our skin. And the livestock industry is poisoning them all. Both the production and the consumption of meat and animal, animal products is creating disasters on so many levels. The forces of nature inside us, according to Deepak Chopra, are the forces of nature outside us. That too is ecology. And it's a simple truism that we too often deny in our society. Many of us are probably environmentalists. We think of us that way. Actually, the majority of Americans say that they're environmentalists, whether they are or not is another matter, but we tend to think of ourselves that, that way. And even we environmentalists tend to talk about uh, sometimes throwing things away. Julia Butterfly Hill reminds us, she's the joyful vegan, she reminds us there is no away. Throwing something away just means putting it somewhere else, usually getting it out of your proximity and effectively dumping it on someone else who has less power and less money. For us, too often, out of sight is out of mind, which is why we don't think of the Amazon rainforest too often. We don't think of the slaughterhouses too often. We don't think of species extinction too often, melting glaciers too often. But out of sight is not, shouldn't be out of mind because there is no away. There's no such thing. We share a universe, and uni means one. We're in a closed system. There is no away. And the environment is not out there. The environment is everywhere. Indeed, we are the environment. So when people choose to eat their fellow earthlings, cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, duck, sheep, goat, fish, all these other uh, beautiful sentient beings, um, they destroy the individual world of the animal because every living being is a world unto themselves and just like you are, just like I am. And then our world interacts with other worlds no different with other animals who live their worlds, who feel pleasure and pain, who experience fear and joy, who themselves have um, their versions of family and friends and they search for food and they want peace just like we want peace. They not only destroy the individual world of the animal, but they destroy nat more of the natural world that we all co-inhabit together. Uh, each time someone transgresses this moral boundary, uh, each time their bloodlust is selfishly satisfied, uh, we march closer to a dystopian future uh, from which some beings and some species never survive. And so by consuming and in a way cannibalizing animals, it depends on your level of analysis. If you think of yourself as very different than animals, then it's other, it's different, it's something else. If we realize that we're living beings, that we're all earthlings together, then it's cannibalism. <clears throat> and um, when we cannibalize other animals, we're consuming and indeed cannibalizing our environment as well, because like I said, we are the environment. When we destroy the environment, we cannibalize the environment. The editors of World Watch magazine in 2004, who at the time at least were not vegetarians, but they're scientists. And good scientists are honest and they follow the information, they follow the truth wherever it leads them. This is what they concluded. The human appetite for animal flesh is a driving force behind virtually every major category of environmental damage. Deforestation, erosion, fresh water scarcity, air and water pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, social injustice, the de destabilization of communities, and the spread of disease. Lee Hall, who's at this 
Festival. We've been e-friends for many years, and we got to meet just yesterday, which was lovely. She's very succinct and very powerful. Lee Hall, go visit her at Friends of Animals, by the way. She said, behind virtually every great environmental complaint, there's, there's milk and meat. We are fouling our own nests while killing some of its inhabitants, and the stench is becoming unbearable. Human beings are not the only species on the planet. We just act like it. Right? And so vegetarianism and veganism can be an antidote to all of these environmental problems, whether they're health problems, extinction problems, deforestation problems, global warming problems. We face so many tragedies, but we have the solution. Just like a lot of spiritual traditions, particularly Buddhism, would teach us, right? We have the solution. The key to unlock this magic door is inside of us. It's just a matter of, you know, what we decide to do. A study came out in 2009 called Livestock and Climate Change. If you haven't seen it, I would certainly urge you to check it out. And you can find a link to it at 51percent.org. Someone made a website called 51percent.org because what they determined is if you, if you include all the factors that go into the livestock industry, all of the factors from the growing to the refrigeration to the shipping to everything else, we find that the livestock industry combined contributes to 51% of greenhouse gases that lead to global warming. A majority. A majority. And so it's important what you do in terms of saving water. It's important what you do in terms of uh, what you drive, what you wear, what you consume and what you don't consume. Recycling is important. Composting is important. Reusing is important. But it's not mutually exclusive. And it turns out what's more important is what you eat. What you eat is more important than what you drive and just about everything else you do, right? And so it's important that we get our governments to be more sustainable, absolutely, and our corporations and our religious organizations and our civic organizations, our families, our cities and our friends, all very important and also not mutually exclusive. But the most important thing that any individual can do is delete meat. Right? Give up meat, give up other animal products, live a more sustainable life. That is by far, actually, the most important thing one can do. In terms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is the most common. And the livestock industry is very carbon intensive. But it's also true that carbon lasts in the atmosphere for, it depends, between 200 and 2,000 years. So we've already caused so much damage, but we can start to reverse that. The second most common gas is methane. And the driving force of methane from a people's perspective is the livestock industry. It turns out that methane is around 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And here's another thing about methane. Whereas carbon dioxide can be in the, in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years, well, the methane might only be in the atmosphere for approximately 12 years. So now we're talking, we're, now we're still in our lifetimes. If we were, as a society, not just as individuals, to go veg now, we couldn't actually stop all of the carbon problems that are going on in our atmosphere. But we could, because of the dissipation of methane, clear up the methane problem, which is 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. We can actually start reversing global warming in our lifetimes. Nitrous oxide is the third most, powerful, uh, third most common greenhouse gas, and it's about 300 times as uh, powerful in terms of global warming as carbon. This, too, is deeply related to the livestock industry. Take something like ammonia. Two-thirds of ammonia produced comes from the livestock industry. That's something we could reverse, and ammonia is a major contributor to acid rain. Hydrogen sulfide is a poison gas. And that's produced particularly by factory farms. In fact, when you hear, uh, and it's so tragic, a farm worker, a factory farm worker uh, dying, it's sometimes because they've been overcome by a cloud of hydrogen sulfide gas. Sometimes uh, farm workers have fallen into one of the manure lagoons 
because our animals produce more manure than even humans produce. And it has to be put somewhere. So they dig these large pits called lagoons. Sometimes these things overflow. Sometimes they dry out a bit, and then wind just carries fecal matter all over the place. Again, the spread of E. coli, that's largely how it happens. And occasionally, someone falls in, and they die from drowning and getting stuck in a manure lagoon. These are just some of these horrible things that happen. When we talk about global warming, uh, it's the most socially disadvantaged who are disproportionately hit by global warming. Of course, it's the animals and the plants, the plants that can't move at all. But it's also people who live on the coast. It's poor people. It's the children and the elderly. It's people with disabilities. It's um, indigenous communities. It's uh, subsistence farmers. It's those who rely on one crop for their livelihood, or those who rely on just a few species for their nutrients. A lot of poor people around the world, they're basically eating two, three, four, five species of food to get at least 90% of their calories. Uh, those are the people that are most um, disadvantaged and in the weakest position to guard against global warming. This, I'm bringing this up because we need to talk about the connections essentially between animal rights and human rights, between animal liberation and human liberation, between what we do as people and how we relate to the rest of the animals on this planet and indeed to the rest of nature. Given this knowledge, when people have it, I forgive the people who don't know about these connections. I forgive people who eat meat and don't know uh, because that's always what they've done. It's what they've been taught by their parents, their religions, whatever else. Um, but once we know, we have a special responsibility. And once you know what's going on in the world, as a lot of people do, and certainly as our leaders do, our political leaders, our economic leaders, many of our cultural leaders, then they could be equated to um, the pre-revolutionary queen, Marie Antoinette, who basically said, let them eat carbon dioxide, right? Well, so if it's going to wipe out populations, so be it. But vegetarianism and veganism is a low-carbon diet. It's a global cooling cuisine. And vegetarians and vegans not only live longer, happier, healthier lives, but, uh, well, let's be honest, we're more cool in more ways than one, right? There's a lot of ways to be cool. Um, if anyone wants to save the planet, according to Paul McCartney, all they have to do is just stop eating meat. We know that vegetarianism, veganism is not only better for your personal health, but it's better for your public health, the health of animals, the health of environment, but it's also psychologically and spiritually healthier. Um, it's traditional in Western religions to eat meat, but when you go to the bases of these religions, we find that they are not even supportive of meat. When you want to support the highest ideals of any religion, you realize that a plant-based diet is the way to go. Um, if, we were to, if we want to achieve peace in this world, we have to have peace in our hearts. We have to have peace in our kitchens. The inside and the outside is always related, as we say. Um, as long as we contribute to cruelty in our diets, we're contributing to cruelty in the world. We may not see it as the same, but it's deeply related. When we condemn uh, violent acts of aggression and war around the world, we should look inside what violent acts of aggression are we committing in our kitchens and in our um, restaurants and at our celebrations. It's so odd to me that people will have celebrations for life cycle events and as part of the celebration are creating such sadness, such sorrow, such suffering and such death for other communities. Vegetarian and veganism is a form of preventive medicine for your own individual health, but it's also a form of sustainability for the environment. There's many things we could talk about, the moral reasons, economic reasons, feminist and other arguments for a plant-based diet, but we'll leave those for another time or for afterwards if you're interested. Vegetarianism, veganism are uplifting in all sorts of ways. We tend to have more energy, higher spirits, and better health. It's a powerful thing. We're not sacrificing anything. 
we're choosing to let other things live and prosper so that we can live and prosper, so that we can thrive. This is not a diet of sacrifice. This is a diet of abundance. And so we can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We can lift psychic burdens off of ourselves and become more spiritually open to the wonders of the world, to the love that's around us. Um, we can personally create the change, as Gandhi the vegetarian suggested, personally create the change that we want to see in the world, not hope for other people to do it, not pray for some other leader to come by and lead us to a, some magical promised land. We can be the leaders. We can be the people. We can create the promised land in that way right here. So if you want to feed at least two birds with one scone, we also need to change our culture that way and how we talk about things. Um, like I said, delete meat. Make every day an Earth Day. It's not once a year. It's every day. Make every day a healthy day. And let's get back to fighting for health and eco-sustainability and for social sanity with our forks, knives, spoons, and chopsticks. Now's the time. And as you know, the answer is in your hand. Or I should get this back. The answer is in your hand. <laughs> Thank you. So now, you know, workshop time. Let's let's talk about issues or ask questions or. Yeah, one thing that um, speaking to the uh, environmental impact of meat and it being a, a primary or perhaps the best way of uh, reducing environmental. And so forth. Um, in the course of going over some of the commonly passed around literature, you know, uh, Livestock Long Shadow, mm -hmm. and the uh, revisions to that, they were mentioning the 51% calculation. Yes. Um, one thing that became clear pretty uh, quickly to me was that the figures being talked about, um, let be at 18% or 51% of pollution being attributable to the uh, livestock industry on a global scale is mostly the consequence of land use changes in the developing world. So most of this uh, carbon dioxide being produced and uh, contributing to global warming is not is from, from clearing rainforests, from uh, you know uh, changing um, and as a consequence like and growing food for livestock is actually right, a large portion. Food for livestock. So, I mean, all of this is long preface, but simply this, <laughs> but just uh, I felt it was necessary to make it clear, is that um, in some ways, even though um, like Livestock Long Shadow, I don't think it's in any way um, encouraging, let's say, factory farming, in many ways I feel it is highlighting that um, traditional <laughs> livestock methods are in fact the majority contributors to global livestock's environmental contribution. So in fact, I feel like when we discuss the environment and meat eating and, and what's good for us um, living in the United States or elsewhere in the developed world, to some extent I feel like these, uh, these other issues of you know, automobiles and do, are, are somewhat underrated. But it, it is still really important to focus on these other things. Because, Absolutely. Um, a lot of this pollution that we're seeing, we're thinking is attributed to our domestic meat production is actually a consequence of foreign developing world meat production. So. Well, but essentially we outsource meat production because <laughs> we're able to do it so cheaply in places like the Amazon for consumption here. So it, it actually tweaks the numbers. So in that it artificially looks like the U.S. is a, you know, a huge contributor, but actually uh, artificially deflates U.S. contributions to global warming because of uh, our, off you know, our offshoring, basically, of meat production. But anyway, I don't actually want to get into that game. No, not your question. I'm not into the game of saying which is worse because I, I pointed out they're not mutually exclusive. Right? Some people say, so should I eat less meat or should I drive less? Um, well, I know people eat a lot in their cars, but you know, it's like, it's, those, are not, those are not connected things, right? Eat less meat and drive less, right? Be more sustainable, right? right? Just, and just because um, 
you know, if you're a, if you're a vegetarian eating no meat, right, that's the equivalent of like someone else uh, in terms of water usage, I didn't t talk about water usage, in terms of like giving up their showers for an entire year, right? Like around two pounds of California beef would be about all the shower water for one year. So, but that doesn't mean if you don't eat meat, let your shower run all the time, right? right? And I know you don't mean that, right? I'm just taking an extreme example. So we could still, you know, shower when you want to shower and then turn it off when you're not. You can still turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth, right, and be a vegan, right? You can drive a more energy efficient car and still be a vegetarian, right? So yes, we need to do all these things and we need to, pu that's why I said we need to push our governments, even for non-meat things, right? Push them to be more solar. We need to push our, uh, you know, religious institutions and our schools to have windmills and and the, uh, and the USDA just said now tofu can be a meat substitute in public school lunches, wow. right? PCRM has been working on that, other groups. So these are not mutually exclusive. We need to do all of these things for sure. Um, a thought and, and something I'd like your, your opinion on and, and others as well. Um, so for me, veganism came sort of as like a, a moral extreme. Mm. You, know, you come to a realization and you're like, I need to completely adhere to, to my realization that you know, these animals are living beings and I need to treat them as such. And, you know, to do that in a society is an extreme thing to do. Um, now, you can continue, I mean, anyone who spends a lot of time with plants sees that those plants have, in some ways, personalities of their own. We're finding out more and more that there may be a level of consciousness to them. Yet, we can't exclude them as well from, I mean, even when you talk about the world as a whole and we're all, part, we're all earthlings, those plants are earthlings too. Sure. And I'm wondering how you and everybody else draws the line between an animal and a plant. Um, you know, I can rip off this thing's leaves, mm -hmm. but I can't rip off this animal's arms. How, well, how okay. I, mean, I, don't, I mean, I personally haven't seen any evidence that, animal, that plants have consciousness, but we do see they may have language amongst each other, they communicate, there's something going there's something on. But they, don't have a, but they don't have a brain, there's no evidence that they feel pain. And, um, you know, if you want to... Right. And if you want to survive, we have to eat. So truthfully, um, veganism, the way it's talked about, if you think of it as an absolute, is actually impossible as a philosophy and as, even as a diet. But if you think of it, and I think this is a better way to think of it, as the goal of minimizing harm and exploitation in the world, then whatever level you're at, if you're minimizing that, and as far as we know, eating plants, even if you believe in that form of consciousness, eating plants is better than eating animals. And then one thing further, that even if you saw them as basically equal, we feed so many plants to the animals we raise. So when you see, if you get to see, and it's glorious, if you see, get to see cornfields, most of that is not for human consumption. The majority is for animal consumption. Uh, a, a, a growing minority is also for biofuels. A very small part is for actual food to eat. And they also, you know, high fructose corn syrup is coming from corn. So actually, the percentage of corn, same with other things, even uh, uh, corn, uh, wheat, soy, oats, alfalfa, disproportionately being fed to livestock animals. So if we, so if we just care about even the plants, if you just care about water, then a plant-based diet uses less plants than an animal-based diet. Plant-based diet uses less water, and that's related to animals and plants as well than a plant-based diet. John? Thank you. And I'm reminded of my own experience. And I like, like for me, experience is the greatest teacher. Of yeah. I mean, I can read books all day long, but my experience is um, kind of more important to me. So my experience was like when the American people reinstalled George Bush as president. Uh, you mean the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court. <laughs> Both times were fraudulent, yeah. I was so angry, like not just that week or that month or that year, I was just so angry at the passion for ignorance mm. that our people are so committed to. And, I, and the anger was killing me. And, um, and I wanted a way out of it. And I felt so powerless politically. Mm -hmm. And I realized that you know, there's one thing I can do. I can go back to eating vegan. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that's what I did. And like someone else said, it's a radical act. Eating vegan is a radical act in our culture. You know, because even kind of one of the reasons, like I can go to a restaurant and the salad is the same price as a hamburger. It makes no sense. Of course. Of course. <laughs> because a hamburger is much more expensive to produce. Mm. And that's something we can change with government subsidies as well. Right, the government subsidies, I mean, the whole system is geared towards meat eating. And, um, you know, and so I don't have to rail against society as much as I used to, uh, because... But I like when you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But eating vegan is such a radical act, and it's so, it's so threatening to other people. And it's like I'm not consuming the cruelty. I would suggest, and not just on this issue, that when any time anyone, you or someone else you'll talk to, feels any combination of anger, powerlessness, hopelessness, the best antidote is to get involved doing something proactive. It's not just about escaping the negativity, it's somehow increasing positivity. So restarting your vegan diet is a good thing. Joining an organization, in terms of your issues, it's another talk, but getting involved in campaign finance reform and electoral reform, uh, getting our government to rechannel subsidies in the farm bill so that it supports, say, organic fruits and vegetables that people actually eat instead of uh, livestock stuff or, or sugar, um, cotton, tobacco, those kinds of things. There's a lot we can do. So whatever the issue is, move towards the positivity, get involved. And actually studies show this too. People who get involved, knowing the same stuff as other people, being, living in the same crazy world as other people, tend to be more optimistic, tend to feel better, less anxious, less depressed, because they're, in some sense, part of the solution, not part of the problem. And it seems to take a burden off of our beings to do that. I'll come to you next. Oh, my pleasure. I love the fact that you've really emphasized the environmental aspect here. Um, the gentleman in the front is asking you know, that question about uh, sentience and all that. And, you know, being brought up in the Jain tradition, oh, okay. you know, we also believe that all souls, all living beings have souls. <coughs> so it is upon us to make sure that we do the absolute minimal amount of harm. So veganism is beautiful, but it's not the only thing. No. Right? Right. I mean, none of us are saying that, but it's also minimization. And so what we eat and the amount of harm that we, you know, cause. And like some people have said, you know, well, plants don't have a central nervous system or a brain or that type of thing. Right? But it should be afforded, you know, our reverence and our appreciation. Absolutely. And so it's that minimization, not just because they're less structured and they feel the pain less, but because we can also eat less and we can also do things because we do things that are so destructive. And this one also matched you mentioned. Yeah, thank you for that. Side, this was that, you know, in terms of like... Uh, just the awareness, and you hit on this really well, is that you know most people are just unaware that consuming animal products, right, results in things like climate change, mm -hmm. global warming, and destabilization of communities, and refugees, and all of this, right. And so we may talk about whether it's eighteen percent or fifty-one percent or something in between, right. But the fact is, this is enormous, right. And, and it's so real living have, people and animals, yeah. That we have, right? And most people will never know that. Because our leaders don't don't take this message and bring it out there. It's too much vested interest. Sure. So people like you and all the people here, with us, and you, all of you, do, <laughs> it's that awareness that unfortunately our leaders, whether they be civic or government or whatever else, you know, don't bring out, right? And I think that's the beautiful, important thing is that this is so powerful hmm. and so impacting. Thank you. Well, we can all do that, and you're honored to be part of probably the most pro-life religion that we've created on this planet, so that's a nice thing. Um, but, and you're right, it's not, things are not mutually exclusive. I do other things as well. I'm also an anti-smoking activist, and I have a webpage about that, because you know, that's also an important issue that relates to uh, personal health and deforestation and public health. There's a lot of issues like that. But the key for people like us, right, um, if pe like I said, if people aren't aware, it is not their fault or their responsibility until they become aware. We all could be activists. And being an activist or an organizer can just mean you mention something to a friend, bring something up to a family member. If you're listening to talk radio, call in and say something about it. If you're in a classroom, say something about it. Raise the issue. You can always make it fit to whatever issue it is we're talking about. 
write a letter to the editor. You know, it's hard to get an article published in the newspaper. Letter to the editor, not easy, but relatively easy. And yet it's the most read section of the newspaper after the front page. And so if you can get a short piece, right, just like five sentences, three sentences in that brings up this issue just to raise awareness, it's very powerful. Make a website or share websites on your social networks. My uh, eco-eating website is, my last name is Brooke, brooke.com slash veg. I wish there was a board here, but there isn't. So you can take a look at that. Feel free to take any information you want from there, attributed or unattributed, because for me it's about getting the information out. So brook.com slash veg and share it in your social networks. Put it online. We do have that power. We, we want our leaders to change. We can't wait for our leaders to change. And the secret, the dirty secret about leaders is that they're followers, not leaders. Almost all of them. Almost all of them. And the other thing is that none of them do it alone. So if we create the social and cultural infrastructure that makes it a bigger issue, you'll see the leaders talking about it. It's not that they don't know. If they're in that position of leadership, they do know about these issues. They're smart people. Whether it's Obama, Romney, or those other people, these are smart people. Most of the corporate CEOs may not like them, but they're smart people, and they know Jill things. Stein Jill Stein would be a fine choice. <laughs> but anyway, it's about raising awareness, about building the cultural infrastructure, not to make major changes now, but to make changes in the next years and generation. We give it to them. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions, comments, thoughts? I was just going to pick up on that. You know, some of the things that I've done, I don't want to blow my horn, but, you know, just because I, I don't know what to do also. I, I get crazy also when I look at, I'm a social worker, and even my fellow social workers are all in child protection. You know, just like, I'm such an oddity. I forgot your name? Helene. Helene. And Helene's from Boston. And Oh, there's uh -huh. a fork to climate change, and there's a fork, and there's a car key, and it says think again, because obviously it's the fork, not the car key. Um, you know, I just, you can get this stuff for free. Maybe. Yes, and you could leave them in libraries or in public community and centers. And like vegan cookies cut out, mm -hmm. you know, and it blows my mind, because I live in a pretty liberal, you know, um, community, but um, people, they don't get it, they, they didn't get it, and then you have to give them a chance. And also some people don't want to get it, and we have to... But mo that's rarely, I, I yeah. find, you know, it, it's the educational, th and also when they taste the vegan chocolate chip cookie, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that helps. So it's a whole lot, but I, I actually find it, it helps me, because what are you going to do? I mean, it, it just, I would just sob myself to sleep every night if I thought about what you, you know, were talking about, all these species, you know, what do you do with that anger? So usually I bring the food into my coworkers, you mm -hmm. know, instead of, they don't want to hear me talking, but if I... You know, it's not that we would, ch not that we would choose this kind of world, but given that we have a world situation like that, like this, um, th there is some actually good news. The good news, at least, is that we have the opportunity to make a major difference. How wonderful it would be to live in utopia, but you actually wouldn't have the opportunity to do such a good deed. You wouldn't have the opportunity to turn people around, to turn people towards this uh, position that respects life on Earth, their own as well as others. So we have that opportunity, and I find that a precious opportunity. I have thought of that. We should get some bumper stickers for kind of reclaim the pro-life. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of, you know, I'm vegetarian. Absolutely. Someone who market. Oh, 
we have them. Where? I bought them outside uh, a couple years ago. Are they here? Yeah, they're here today. All right. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, the head scientist for NASA um, uh, points out that the... Hansen? Is that yes, that, that uh, the, the one thing that we can all do to turn around this uh, dynamic of warming of our planet is to Yes. And he also points out, in contrast to what you what you stated, is that carbon dioxide is the main component to that detriment to our uh, our home. It is more impact from the methane and nitrous oxide that is uh, I want to say fifty one percent is is pointed out. Well. Is, Oh, absolutely. Oh, we have tens of billions of animals on an annual basis. Yes, yes it's huge. I, I don't think that magnitude uh, is uh, never aware. In, in again, I think that's one of those things that's hard to get our minds around. I don't actually know what 50 billion means. We might see a, an acknowledgement of an organic farmer holding up that organic farmer, but we'd never see in the butcher department a photograph of the suffering that's correct. Bled, yeah. While it's still alive. Yeah. To ensure that it is grain growing. Yeah. Uh, and so, they, or, or it's high strip while it's still alive. Yeah. 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 So, these things we get to um, know through watching that film like Earthling. Yeah. And you can download that because the, the creator of that film so wants that knowledge to be out there. You can choose to download that for free. And if you wish, you know, make a donation. But it's excellent. Uh, yeah, good. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, but I, I just have one other point, sure. which is the flatulence that the, the animals um, generate. What was your, I wasn't clear on what was your point as to how that is exacerbated. How it's exacerbated. exacerbated. Well, it's uh, the flatulence and the burping of the animals that releases a lot of these gases, actually, and that's what contributes to global warming. So, any, but my understanding is, my understanding is industry that wants to make profit, they do not select the, the uh, grasses that the animals would normally oh, Of course, of course. They, they select like uh, uh, rye grass, which gives them, a, that was the point they made, something about indigestion. Ah, from eating, well, because they feed them a lot of grains as well to fatten them up faster yeah, instead of grass. The, the, the reality is because uh, a grain like rye is cheaper. Yes. But they'll, get, they'll get that, and that exacerbates that yeah, I mean, it's not cheaper as a raw material. It's cheaper at, in terms of creating the product. They just want the fattest animal in the shortest amount of time. Oh, well, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, just on that uh, global warming gases thing, no, I mean, carbon dioxide is the most common gas, but methane and nitrous oxide are so much more powerful in terms of gases that effectively it's more. So we talk about the carbon footprint, which is important, and we need to deal with that. But even more important is our methane mouth print, because of the meat that people eat actually contributes more to global warming than carbon dioxide. But again, it's not one or the other, not mutually exclusive. We need to do both and, not either or, but both and. So we need to end now. So go out there and do what you need to do. Thank you.
Let me encourage you to join your local uh, vegetarian society. If it's this one, you can support uh, vegetarian festivals like this or join whichever one where you live or um, get a subscription to a vegetarian or vegan magazine, but get connected to the community in some way where you'll get even more information, you'll feel that much more part of our community, and you'll financially help out an organization that does more as an organization than normally we can do as individuals. Thank you very much. Have a great day.